Do you want an easier way to remember the different causes of shock? Watch this video to find out. So welcome to this short video on the causes of shock and essentially what we're going to do here is categorize these causes into an, a way of easy memorization. So firstly, what is shock? Shock is essentially a clinical syndrome where there is inadequate perfuse, perfusion and therefore oxygenation of tissues in the body, therefore we can't perform metabolic functions. Now, traditionally, the way we broke up shock or categorize shocks by causes uh, are, thing, are through things like hypervolemic shock, obstructive shock, cardiogenic shock, and then finally distribution shock. But what I thought I would do here is hopefully a method to make it easier for you to remember these, these different causes and kind of the mechanisms behind it. So let's go through this image quickly and that hopefully will make sense of it. So out here we've got all the fluids of the body. So this is essentially the total amount of fluids in your body and it's held in here with this bucket. Then we bring the tubes from this fluid back to the heart. So this is essentially illustrating a vessel bringing blood back to the heart itself. And here we have the heart and then in the heart we distribute it out to the cells and the tissues of the body out here in blue. And so what we can do is break these um, image, this image up into four parts. So we've got A, B, C, and D. Okay, so let's start off with the bucket. So this is essentially all the fluid in your body. So for a typical 70 kilo person, you've got about 60% fluid in your body. That means you've got about 25% of water or fluid in your cells, and you've got about 14 liters of fluid outside your cells, or what we call extracellular fluid. And of that 14 liters, about five liters is what we call blood. Now of that fluid, if you have a reduction in that fluid, that would lead to causes that we call hypovolemia. Okay, and because this is a fluid amount, A here is amount. So A for amount. Now the way that you can remember the different causes of hypovolemia is causes based on blood loss. So we could call this intravascular loss, intravascular. Okay, and so what are the different intravascular causes, which are essentially hypovolemic? This is where you would lose whole blood. So if you were to be stabbed or shot and fluid came, or blood came out of you, that's a, that's a loss of, of blood that would potentially lead to hypovolemia. Or you might have bleeding in your GIT tract. So if you were vomiting blood or um, defecating blood, that would be a blood loss. Okay, so that's whole blood. Now you might also have blood loss into spaces. So it's what we call concealed blood loss. So if you were to have, let's say a ruptured uh, abdominal aort aortic aneurysm or AAA and that bled into your cavity, your abdominal cavity, you wouldn't see it, but you would still get blood loss. Or you might have an ectopic pregnancy where you're bleeding off into the pelvic cavity. That's concealed blood loss, but it's still blood loss and it's still intravascular. So you can have blood, whole blood. Another thing that you could have loss is plasma. So you could also, it's still intravascular, which means it's still part of the blood, but you could lose plasma. And ways of losing, losing plasma would be through lots of sweating, a lot of dehydration. So that's one. Or you might have three degree burns, third degree burn, should I say, where um, you've lost that patency of the skin and fluid just starts leaking out. And that's essentially plasma. Or you might have loss of plasma through something called ascites, where you have edema uh, within just before the liver and the portal vein loses um, plasma out into the peritoneal cavity and that is ascites that would also lead to in intravascular fluid loss, ultimately also hypervolemia. Another thing is the extravascular. So this is, means fluid loss, but not from out of your blood vessel. And two main ones to remember here is GIT loss, 
So a good example of losing fluid extravascularly through the GRT would be lots of diarrhea or lots of vomiting. Or you could have renal loss, which would be if you had a patient with DKA or diabetes ketoacidosis or just poorly managed diabetes where they're peeing a lot, lots and lots of polyuria, that would also lose a lot of fluid. Therefore, you're going to lose, um, go into a hypovolemic state, therefore could progress into shock. So the take home point here is many different ways of losing fluid, but generally categorized into intra and extravascular, all fit under the hypovolemic umbrella, but it's all about amount. And we remember A for amount. Okay, so that's the first one done. Moving on to B, and this is the obstructives. So what's happening here is essentially the way that the blood is going back to the heart, there is a blockage. So the heart isn't getting loaded with blood. Okay, so obstructive causes, or you might want to say blockage. So B for blockage. Okay, pretty easy. So what could block the flow back to the heart? Well, you might have a PE. So if you had a clot that came up from, let's say your iliac vein and it traveled up into your heart, right side of the heart, then went off to go to the lungs and then you had a blockage. I know this is not accurate anatomically, but you get the, the idea. That means the blood going to the lung and therefore to the left ventricle to pump out the body is lost. Therefore we have a blockage, therefore we have obstruction and that's going to result in blood not going out to the tissues, which is essentially shock. So PE is one. Another one would be if you had a breakage of a blood vessel around the heart, these are the coronary vessels, and blood filled the space, the pericardium. This is called a tamponade, a cardiac tamponade. So I'll just put a tamponade, tampon aid. So this would essentially restrict the heart and the heart can't fill anymore. That would also cause an obstruction form of um, shock. Another one would be a pneumothorax, particularly a tension pneumothorax. So let's say you were to be stabbed, your lung collapsed, but it not only collapsed, but it collapsed under tension. So that means it started to move across to the other side. As it moved across, it started to compress the heart, or it maybe even compress the blood vessels feeding the heart. This is the superior inferior vena cava. That means the heart's not getting blood, therefore you've got an obstruction, or B for blockage. Okay, so also a tension pneumothorax. Okay, so that's two done. Moving on to C. C for heart. So this is a pretty easy one. So cardiogenic. So C for cardiogenic and just means cardio means heart. Genic means to create. So this is a type of shock generated by the heart. So anything to go that goes wrong with the heart itself that's not getting a pressure out to the body, therefore we go into a decreased perfusion, then we go for in a shock, would be a cardiogenic. Now there's some different ways to categorize cardiogenic shocks. You might have a drop or a decrease in contractility. Contractility. This usually refers to the left ventricle because that's pushing the blood out to the body. So if you lost contractility of the left ventricle, this would cause cardiogenic shock, such as the most common would be a heart attack, an MI, particularly the left, left ventricle that would lose its contractility power potential, therefore it can't get fluid out or blood out. Another example would be uh, myocarditis, so it, the muscle is inflamed, can't get force out, or maybe your patient's taken too much of a drug that loses its beating potential like a calcium channel antagonist. So that's one category being decreased contractility. Another one would be, let's say, a decrease in preload cause. Okay, a good example of decrease in preload would be if you had a MI, but on the right ventricle, therefore the right ventricle is not pushing blood out to the lungs and then to the left ventricle, therefore it's not loading Therefore, we have a decrease in output. Therefore, we have a cardiogenic shock. So that's two. Uh, another one would be uh, dysrhythmias. So dysrhythmias. So this would be the rhythm of the heart so poor that you're not getting output. Examples would be VT. So the heart's so quick, it's not filling. Therefore, there's no output. So VT would be example. AF, where the, the, vent, the atria is not really doing much. It's just kind of like a jelly and there's no blood going down into the ventricles, therefore no output, or just a, some bradycardias where the heart is so slow, you're getting no output. And then finally, 
um, you lose the flow forward. So no flow forward. And that could ex be examples going out to the aorta, there's stenosis or mitral stenosis and their blood's not moving through the heart well. That would also le lead into cardiogenic. And remember C for cardiogenic. So lastly, we're, we're left with D. D for distribution. So what this means is you're not distributing blood out to the tissues. So all this side is okay, but the blood going out to the tissues isn't occurring. So this is a distribution shock. What usually happens here is the blood vessels just get really big. They dilate. That means the flow out is really poor. Now, some causes of this would be neurogenic. So this is where the nerves supplying the blood vessels are dysfunctional, therefore it results in them dilating, therefore the pressure is very poor, therefore the tissue perfusion is poor, therefore we have shock. Neurogenic, a good example would be a spinal cord injury, particularly above a certain level, and there's a dysregulation of the, particularly the sympathetic nervous system. So neurogenic is a good one. Another one would be anaphylactic. So anaphylactic is where your immune system reacts to something inert like, let's say, peanuts, and it's so reactive, it releases so much histamines. Histamines causes vasodilation, so much vasodilation, there's no flood flow out to the body, therefore we go into shock. So anaphylactic is another good one. And then finally, an inflammatory cause would be like a septic shock. An example of a septic shock where you have, let's say, a bacteria, it's um, colonized you, particularly in your blood, your, it, it either releases a toxin like an exotoxin which then causes your um, blood vessels to react or as your immune system can't, starts killing it off, as it dies it releases endotoxins which again both of them releasing um, cytokines and so forth which causes the blood vessels to dilate and again we lose pressure, we lose perfusion and we go into shock. The only difference is with the distribution shock, which is important to remember, at least in the early phase of shock, because we've got so much vasodilation, the tissue may actually feel warm. Whereas in these forms, because we're getting such poor output, these patients in these forms of shock would actually probably feel cold and clammy. Whereas these guys in the early stage might actually be quite warm because you are got so much dilation. So there we have it. Hopefully now you've can see when you categorize the different causes of shock, if you just do A, B, C, D, amount, blockage, cardiogenic, distribution, that'll be a much easier way to remember.